Hello everybody, this is the recording of the address by Federal Education Minister Simon Birmingham at Education Nation on Wednesday the 8th of June 2016. Uh, Minister Birmingham's voice is the main voice that you'll hear. There was some time for questions from the floor at the end, uh, but it is predominantly Minister Birmingham's voice and his is the first voice that you'll hear after mine. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, and, uh, and good morning, everybody. And um, uh, Jamie, yes, it is week five an election, of an election campaign, and I am particularly pleased to be with you all this morning because, uh, yes, you are right in terms of last-minute travel changes that I think in all but one of the five weeks so far in this election campaign, my travel schedule has at some point changed at less than 24 hours' notice, uh, and indeed that happened earlier this week as well, but happily I'm still in Sydney today and able to uh, be with you all this morning. And can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and all of Australia's Indigenous peoples and as Australia's Education Minister particularly acknowledge that we continue to learn much more about the traditional knowledge of our Indigenous uh, forebears and of course uh, learn much from it and to of course build upon it as a nation. Some of you will have heard me uh, tell this story before, but uh, I like to tell it because it's, it's a cute story, but it also is a great insight that as educators you would appreciate. Earlier this year I got home from Canberra one Friday morning just in time to take my five-year-old daughter off to school. Reception, we call it in South Australia, or kindergarten, I think it is here for the, of course, foundation year. And on the way to school, Matilda said to me, Daddy, after school today, can we go to the moon? I said, well, a bit hard to go to the moon. Matilda, you need a rocket ship to be able to go to the moon. Well, after school today, can we get a rocket ship and go to the moon, Daddy? Well, rocket ships are very hard to come by, Matilda. They're very complicated uh, and they're very, very expensive. Well, after school today, can we buy a rocket ship and go to the moon, Daddy? Great perseverance and persistence, as most five-year-olds have. Well, Matilda... Uh, they're very, very expensive, these rocket ships. I don't know where we could go and buy one, but if we, if we, even if we could find one that you could buy to go to the moon, um, I'm not sure Mummy and Daddy can afford a rocket ship. Well, Daddy, you'll just have to work harder then, he said. <laughs> now, I like to tell the story, because it's cute, but it also, of course, uh, is uh, a demonstration, as you well know, uh, of the uh, limitless thought and capacity that young children have in terms of what can be done, what can be achieved. Uh, and it is, of course, that potential, uh, that those limitless, boundaryless ideals that they have uh, that we seek to harness as a nation and that you seek to harness as leaders in our education sector. I really do welcome the discussion that you're having here at the Education Nation Forum over these couple of days and more generally, I know, in the associated activities, uh, because uh, your approach to thinking about what it is we can do to best harness that potential of all of the nation's children is absolutely essential. I have confidence that I'm in a very fortunate position of being able to provide the best for my children. But as the Education Minister, my ambition has to be and is to make sure that we can provide the best for all of the nation's children from all of their different and diverse backgrounds. But I think firstly in these discussions it is always important because too often in today's debate the negatives are focused on. It's important to recognise and celebrate that we have an education system in Australia of which we can be very proud, which is a very good system and that we should spend a little bit more time perhaps celebrating and not quite so much time focusing on its challenges. Overall, our performance is above most of the OECD averages. We actually do do very well. We, of course, provide remarkable levels of universal access as we should, good outcomes as we should. Financially, we support our schools, generally speaking, above the OECD averages as well. So it's a good system, underpinned by good basics and foundations. But, yes, we equally need to acknowledge that we can do better, 
And you wouldn't all be here today if it were perfect and impossible for us not to do better, uh, because you're here out of that commitment and desire to ensure that we do do better. The challenges are equally relatively well understood. We have a long tail in terms of student performance. We've seen a decline in terms of the performance of some of our best achieving students as well. So we have challenges that sit at both ends of that spectrum. Our PISA scores have, in both real and relative to other nations' terms, gone backwards in a number of categories. These are in that plan, as I know you've been discussing, are not uh, the sole determinants of whether or not we're performing well or a school is determining well, but they're important indicators that we should equally not ignore. We face particular challenges as a nation, as indeed most of uh, the Western world does, about how we best equip students for a rapidly changing global environment. You know, Ten years ago, the iPhone hadn't been released onto the market. Netflix didn't stream out to uh, people's television sets around the world. And Facebook was only one year old. A lot's changed in ten years in terms of the type of economic environment in which we operate. And what the environment will be for today's students when they finish their studies and enter the workplace is something that we can't necessarily know or predict. But we do know that the STEM skills in science, technology, engineering and maths uh, are going to be critical to more and more jobs. Whatever the sector, whatever the industry in which students go and work, more roles will require a richness of understanding across those skills. So it's with those various challenges in mind that I welcome the discussions you've been having here uh, and really do look forward uh, to seeing the types of outcomes and ideas from these discussions that we can use to help inform the future direction of our education system in Australia. My commitment is absolutely to make sure that we are driven as best we can be by evidence, by information that appropriately reflects what can deliver the best results for student outcomes, for those who are, of course, at the heart of our education system. We must make sure that the system essentially addresses two key aims. A system that delivers the basics, the basics upon which essentially all learning can occur, the basics upon which all future studies or employment activities uh, will rely, as well as preparing students for the dynamic world in which they will enter, uh, to be adaptable, to be collegiate, to be capable of working in modern work environments. Those two aims need to be treated as complementary. Too often, I'll come back to this in a second, too often it strikes me that we seem to say it's you know, about one or the other. Uh, well, it's actually, of course, about ensuring uh, that all of those aspects of learning are built upon and delivered. Now, our commitment as a government stretches across a number of areas of potential reform. Firstly, because it tends to get a fair running at present in relation to funding. Federal funding for school systems around Australia, if the Turnbull government is re-elected, will grow from around $16 billion this year to more than $20 billion in 2020. But the truth is, despite what some of the commentary has said, whoever wins this election, there will be more funding going into our school system. Now, I don't pretend that there aren't differences in those funding equations, uh, but I just want to make sure that it is clear and well understood funding will grow. Our commitment is to make sure that funding is distributed according to need, that we actually do deliver greater resources to those who need it most to help their adjustment, greater resources to those of low socioeconomic background, students with a disability, Indigenous students, small rural or regional schools, those types of loading factors that are well appreciated and understood across the system. So funding will grow. Our commitment is to make sure that we do address some of the challenges in the basics, that we face up to some of those declining performances in terms of reading, writing and literacy, 
maths and sciences, that we do ensure that we actually deliver across the schooling system uh, minimum standards of achievement in literacy and numeracy from school leavers. Now those things won't be easy to do, but we have to set them down as identifiable and clear targets. But we want to make sure that at the very foundation stone of learning, the capability of students to read, we address the fact that around 200,000 Australian students are estimated to not, in terms of their reading skills, uh, be at a satisfactory level to participate in the other areas of learning and their school environment. So early identification of those students and then early intervention is of course critical to then helping them uh, to learn and succeed thereafter. Equally, basics on one side, then of course the changing global environment and STEM on the other. Uh, that across our national innovation and science agenda and other measures, uh, we've released around 14, delivering around 14 different measures to try to lift STEM engagement and involvement from the training available to teachers uh, through the support we're giving to the University of Adelaide to run a MOOC that's available to uh, those right across the country to skill up in terms of technology training and involvement uh, through to greater early years support uh, right down into our preschools uh, for uh, students to be able to access um, STEM related uh, apps and programs that can help them to learn and inspire their interest uh, through of course to lifting the level of ambition uh, in terms of those going on to university uh, and their study of maths and science. We really want to make sure that we fix and address the way in which uh, NAPLAN works so that it provides and transparency and accountability measures generally provide richer data and information to schools, to teachers, in faster time so that people can actually make greater use of that information and see the benefit of it and actually ensure that it does deliver changes in terms of the treatment of individual students uh, and their support within the classroom. We want to back the continued research and advancement of teaching programs and information that can enable us to ensure focus on student progression. Not just about benchmarking students to an average, but individual progression to ensure a year's worth of learning for a year's worth of teaching, whatever the individual capabilities of those students. And of course, related to that is about supporting continued improvements in teacher quality, especially in terms of initial teacher education uh, and the types of things we can do uh, to lift the work within our universities uh, to ensure the standards of future graduates are high and do actually give people confidence in relation to where our education and school system is going. Too often, as I said before, it strikes me in my time in the portfolio that the types of debates we seem to have uh, around education policy are pitched as two extremes or two polar opposites. That it's a debate about whether we fund one sector versus another, about whether we teach basics to children or whether we teach them STEM or coding or the like, about whether we apply direct instruction type pedagogies or whether it is about experience-based learning. The truth, of course, is that all of those issues probably sit in a grey zone, that it depends on the student, it depends on the school, it depends on the environment, and that we need to back the autonomy of principals, teachers, school communities to make the right decisions for their students to get the balance between all of those areas right. We need to follow evidence. Not all evidence is equal, of course. Uh, some comes with prejudices of those who have written it uh, or commissioned it. But we need to follow long-term evidence about what gets the best possible outcomes for our students. We need to skill our teachers, as I said before, and we need to empower and engage parents. I often say that if I had a magic wand that as Education Minister I could wave over one aspect of the education system, it wouldn't be about our schools or teachers. It would be about the home environment and the engagement uh, of parents and families in learning, because that, of course, uh, is the foundation for 
the learning environment. Teachers are the most important in-school factor, uh, but parents, of course, have the greatest influence of ambition and commitment uh, to learning in terms of a child's life. So how we ensure all of that comes together is central. What parents usually tell me is, of course, that they want both a great education for their children and the confidence that there'll be jobs for them in the future. Those two things come together uh, in environments like this because what you're doing is skilling students to succeed in the world after school. That success is in part about getting a job as well as leading a rich and successful life in all other areas. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, what we hope to achieve through all of our different plans. Today, I gather, is meant to be a good, engaging session, so I'm not going to keep my remarks going on, but rather take your questions today. But thank you very much for the commitment you've all shown by attending this session, uh, by attending this conference, and by uh, engaging in the discussion about uh, reform, uh, what it means, and how it can best achieve results for our students in the future. Thank you. Minister, thank you for your attendance today and actually entering into a dialogue with us. It's really appreciated and highly valued. Uh, Dr John Montgomery from the Scots College, just so you know who I am. Uh, I just want to, the question I want to ask, I just want to contextualise, so I hope you don't mind indulging me just for a moment. Um, I was really encouraged to hear you talk about uh, the wellness and the healthiness of our education system in Australia and, and, and the trajectory that we're on. Uh, we did have a lot of conversations yesterday about the validity of the PISA data and how, because of the way that a lot of our other OECD countries uh, utilise the test, for example, uh, some streaming schools and only letting our top banded schools do the test, not letting rural or immigrant students take the test, uh, the difficulties that arise when you translate the test into different cultures and that the uh, ability to actually make uh, valid and reliable comparisons is compromised by a lot of those factors and they need to be considered and to seek extra data to justify that. So one of the questions we had yesterday which wasn't fully explored was in Australia. We have, particularly in New South Wales, a standard reference test in the HSC that is very reliable in comparing from one year to the next and to see how we're progressing in improving the quality of outcomes for our students. And the data there would suggest we're not doing so badly, uh, that we're not going backwards, that we're probably actually going forwards. Um, and because uh, the decisions that then get made uh, based on how we're going, sometimes we may miss seeing some of the really, really great things that are happening and, and grab hold of those and saying, let's actually focus in on what's working really, really well and grow, grow that if the message is not, and if we don't look down into it and drill down to it more deeply. One of the things I think the federal government can do to assist this powerfully, there's been obviously a very strong move to try and nationalise a curriculum, but we haven't yet had a federal approach to how we look at the professional learning and development and standards of teachers. It's still very state-based and very differently operated. So if a teacher moves, yesterday we heard of a teacher moving from the Northern Territory uh, to, us, to New South Wales, who uh, couldn't just transfer and start teaching, they had to start again and it was a completely different process and, and not helping to create outcomes. So is the federal government open to or looking at that as perhaps the next roadblock to smash down to get a better national system for supporting teacher growth and development? Thanks, uh, thanks John. Uh, I'll try to quickly address the diversity of issues you raised. Firstly, no single data source should be seen as the be-all and end-all of information upon which to guide decisions. So um, PISA is useful, but no doubt imperfect. That plan is useful, but no doubt imperfect. Um, the same could be said across any other different measure uh, that is applied. So it is about, of course, reading the collective nature of those data sources uh, to then help to drive and inform uh, decision-making, and particularly decision-making that is based on evidence. Now, we're, you know, I'm very passionate about making sure that we are driven by the best available information and data, but also that we're not driven to the extent of collecting data or looking at data for the sake of it. Um, so right now, as many of you may know and some of you may have made a submission to, 
um, the Productivity Commission was asked since I became Minister to take a look at the type of data sources we have in terms of education assessment um, and reform in Australia, to consider their appropriateness, to consider the burden they place uh, on schools uh, and to uh, look at how that can actually be improved to make sure we're doing and collecting the things that are useful and doing so in the most efficient way possible that takes the least amount of time for uh, teachers and principals away from their core activities. Um, as you'd also know, I, you know, we recently appointed a new Federal Secretary of the Department of Education who hailed from New South Wales here. Uh, and one of the things that attracted me most about Michelle and her background uh, is that her PhD uh, is in uh, data uh, and um, those types of um, assessment processes uh, that can help to uh, give you a system-wide look at things. Now, again, we have to be conscious each school is different, each, just as each student is different. And so I never pretend that aggregate national figures uh, give us you know, the correct answer, uh, but I do think that actually making sure that all of our policy approaches are driven by good information is critical. Um, and a real challenge, I think, in the system uh, is how we establish effective feedback loops so that things that are working in one school are identified as working successfully in that school and that we can make sure that the information about that is picked up and shared so that similar schools uh, can adopt those types of measures, that innovation needs to be encouraged in the school environment, but critically it also needs to be able to be identified, adapted and replicated uh, across other environments where it is working well. Um, in terms of the final part of, uh, of your comments and particularly your question, I guess, around professional standards and professional development for teachers. Uh, we outlined in our policies that we released around the budget uh, a very strong commitment to wanting to see the Australian professional standards for teachers um, adopted, as they have been in uh, some systems, including the New South Wales government system, as a benchmark for reward, as a benchmark for pay. Now, it's been misrepresented in some quarters as being performance pay. Of course, it's not performance pay in terms of the classic concept of paying teachers against a, a NAPLAN score or some other measure of performance. Uh, it's about actually saying that teachers who go to the effort of submitting the work to be recognised as being highly accomplished teachers or lead teachers ought to be rewarded for that. And we ought to be encouraging uh, those types of professional development activities, recognising uh, teachers when they have gone through it, rewarding them for it, um, so that the career path is about more than time served in terms of reward for effort, and that we can try to then keep our best teachers in the system, in our schools, and ideally start to report on how many of those highly accomplished or lead teachers we have in different schools and put the incentives in place to get more into our most disadvantaged schools, uh, where, again, we know that then quality teaching can make the biggest difference uh, to outcomes. Same can be applied in terms of principles and assessment against the professional standards for principals and certification <coughs> processes there. Um, these are, of course, not um, standards dreamt up by me or bureaucrats in Canberra, but are developed largely by the profession and experts through AITSU uh, and actually can, I think, to set a good baseline for the encouragement of those types of uh, professional development activities and hopefully for the lifting of the status of the profession, uh, which, again, is something I'm very, very passionate about. Thank you. We've probably got time for another couple, so a fairly snappy question and one question, please. In the middle. Oh, uh, thank you, Minister, for being here today. Uh, Dennis Yarrington, President, Australian Prime and Principal Association. Um, we talk about reform. Um, how do you see the role of um, principals and, and what's the government's suggestions of including and the role for principals in supporting the education strategy that you've just been talking about? Well, okay, uh, principals are in one of, if not perhaps, the most important positions for their place uh, in terms of reform. Principals need to be the uh, chief uh, leader within a school environment uh, of um, driving um, teachers in their application of uh, any change in policy program or direction uh, that is appropriate and a good fit for those schools. Um, but yes, from my perspective, principals also need to be part of the um, feeding up uh, the agenda to 
education bureaucrats and ultimately to politicians about the types of policy measures that we apply. Uh, my commitment is absolutely to try to be as consultative as possible in terms of the approach that I take and the federal government takes. And of course, Dennis, I've uh, met with, uh, met with um, primary principals as I have uh, um, other principal bodies and, uh, and most other representative bodies across the, uh, across the sector. Uh, and I want to continue that and if, if need be or uh, if it would be welcomed, have a look at how we can formalise, I don't want to create another bureaucracy there, but you know, formalise some of those consultation processes um, to make sure that your feedback and input uh, is clearly there when we come together uh, as an education council with the state and territory ministers to discuss the types of reforms that, um, that flow through from those decision-making processes. It's an interesting role being a federal minister. You know, I don't run any schools and I don't employ any teachers or principals. Um, but we have a leadership role to play, uh, particularly in terms of uh, working with the states and territories. Uh, and I would warmly welcome uh, perhaps a richer level of input into our decision-making processes from those principles uh, for when we go to talk to uh, the states and territories and particularly through the Education Council process. One more question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, delighted to hear you celebrating what actually education is doing really well because we hear so much about what it's not doing. And um, Also, um, your recognition of that sort of one year's learning growth for one year's education, which is a some fantastic benchmark as a parent, that heartens me to hear that and was a subject of big discourse yesterday. And also, again, the long-term evidence base of um, research policy on which education policy will be established. But with that obviously comes resourcing, and I think in the sort of extra 1.2 million that was promised in the budget, you suggested in your quality schools, quality outcomes paper, there will be significant requirements to the state and treasuries to comply with certain requirements to be able to draw down that funding, and I'd hate to think in the future that will be contingent on the extra funding that's going to come to support these programs. So to that end, how are you going to establish that consensus of opinion between the states and territories to reach an agreement, and will that same veracity of agreement apply to all sectors of education across Australia? So therein lies, to some extent, the, you know, the classic tension that can exist as, uh, as a federal government in this space. Do we hand over record sums of money as it is currently flowing into the system and as will keep flowing into the system, no strings attached? Um, and in a sense, then hope that just by talking about things we can exercise our role uh, of providing some leadership in school reform? Or do we say, well, we're actually a partner in the system, not just a check writer, but a partner who expects certain things to occur as a result of the record levels of funding that we provide. Now, I'm a reasonable person. I'm not going to go to the states and territories and say, well, we've listed in a policy paper a range of areas that we think um, require reform, and you must comply to the letter with every one of these, or no funding will flow. That's not a position I'll take. I will engage in a collaborative way uh, with principals, teachers, parent bodies, uh, and the states and territories and the non-government sectors um, to work through the priorities we've identified, see how they can best be implemented, uh, and make that part of an overall arrangement. Um, so, from my perspective, it's about cooperative working with the states and territories, not just holding a gun at the head, but I would hope and trust that the states and territories, uh, if the measures we've put forward, which you think are reasonable and founded on evidence, are reasonable and they are founded on evidence, and that we can get a good conciliatory and cooperative approach from the other stakeholders as to how they should be applied, well then I would hope the states and territories will work with us to do so. Uh, and recognise that uh, um, the Commonwealth's growing contribution to school resourcing uh, does equally warrant the Commonwealth having a say, to some extent, in how that resourcing is utilised. Right. I'm told we've got time for one more. Hi, I'm um, Joanna Mackey from New South Wales Department of Education, State Office. Um, I was very excited when the Australian curriculum um, came about. I think it's been long overdue. 
However, I have concerns when you've got three of the biggest states, New South Wales, Vict Victoria and WA, actually doing their own thing. In other words, they haven't actually taken the Australian curriculum in its native form. They've actually taken it into their, their own syllabuses, which really does get away from what the Australian curriculum was set out to do in the first place. And my other concern is, do we really have a national curriculum when we don't actually have national assessment? I'm not talking about NAPLAN, but we have obviously HSC, we have you know, VELS in Victoria. So where are we heading in terms of this national curriculum? Uh, well, that's a, a great question. And um, certainly we've, you know, we've discussed in, in my office and with my department uh, around um, the final couple of years that fall outside of the national curriculum and what the priorities and direction there should be. Um, just as you know, we obviously look to see how jurisdictions are implementing the national curriculum and this of course is but year one uh, theoretically of, uh, of implementation of the revised arrangements and so on. So uh, it's early days in terms of implementation. Um, I don't want to strangle systems of um, their ability to innovate, their ability to focus on their priorities. Uh, but I do think that um, parents uh, generally uh, <coughs> like the idea of a national curr curriculum for the benchmarks it provides, for the portability it provides, um, uh, that teachers generally do, although I note that, uh, of course, we don't have national registration uh, processes for teachers. Um, so uh, there are different issues that they face in terms of uh, the portability of skills, but at least portability of... Uh, of um, the national curriculum is something that, uh, that they can take as something that would better enable them to shift around the nation. Um, look, I think uh, uh, we have to at least give the current reforms some time to see how they've been applied, what's working and not working, before we necessarily say, well, um, we need to try to encourage those states taking different approaches to come more into line, or that we need to extend it in some way into years 11 or 12. Um, but I think certainly, certainly if I were one of the smaller states, and of course I hail from one of the smaller states, um, I might look at uh, the resources it takes to uh, run your own HSC type process and, uh, and to build the curriculum at that highest level of, uh, of attainment in the school system uh, and think, well, could we get more academically robust, uh, more evidence-based results if we collaborated a bit more with some of the other states of Australia rather than each working to our own independent silos there. So I'm open to encouraging the discussions there between the states about where we might expand and improve uh, upon outcomes. And, of course, one of the things about Year 12 and the Year 12 certificates around the country is that you know, it's that final point that drives much of what happens beforehand. Um, and that is, of course, what students are leading up to uh, in many ways, uh, and that's what schools are preparing students for, particularly in their secondary years. Uh, so having a national curriculum that ends in Year 10, but then different approaches that apply uh, for Years 11 and 12, um, does in some ways seem counterintuitive. You might have worked almost better to have a common approach in Year 12 and allow the flexibility for systems to work out how they best get to that um, common uh, endpoint of ambition. But uh, they're discussions that I'm very open to having, but I'm also very conscious that we've only just reached a certain point in the national curriculum's rollout, um, and it would probably be a little overly ambitious to start uh, trying to leap for the next point uh, before we've got this one bedded down completely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join with me in thanking the Minister for giving up his time. To this as far as the national curriculum is concerned, I was at a briefing the other day and I think we're up to iteration 8.1. So you might like to wait till we get to iteration 10, 11, or 12, or whatever.